Welcome back to the Pearly Podcast. Uh, here we go again with uh, another renowned dentist, Dr. Som Ling from the Sunshine Coast in sunny Queensland. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Som Ling. Thank you for having me on. Looking forward to chatting to you. All right. The reason you're an extra special guest is because you've done some amazing work um, volunteering around the Pacific Islands, helping to improve oral health. And that's what we're all about here at Pearly. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and then how you got involved with uh, this, this, this type of work. So I've always um, wanted to do some volunteer work. My parents met doing uh, working as a doctor and nurse in PNG. And so I always grew up on stories about the Pacific Islands and their, their work over there. And then when I owned a practice in Wollombar, the doctor who had a, uh, the doctor working next door to me uh, married a Solomon Islander. Uh, lady and her father was the chief of the uh, area and so he was building a hospital and wanted to build a dental clinic so he asked if I could go over there and have a look at the area and build a clinic so that's how it all started. Wow when so when when are we talking now how long ago? Uh, 2012 I went over there. Um, nearly, nearly 10 years you've been Working in the in the Solomon Islands. Um, so, what, what was it like back then when you you first arrived, and, and what have you been working on since then? It was quite daunting when I first first got there. Uh, I flew to Honiara, and then we flew to the the province, which was about a one hour uh, flight. And then I was met with a local government official, and then he took me by boat down to his area. Uh, And the boat trip was really, really rough. Um, It was a small, what they call a banana boat. So it's roughly a metre and a half half wide and quite long and you're out in the open sea. So that was quite daunting. Did you have all your supplies? Um, I basically took a a set of of instruments, some forceps and some local anaesthetic and, and went over there and... Yeah, so it's quite a hectic boat ride. And I remember getting, arriving in, in Namuga and it's a big bay and it was dark and they were using certain houses that had their lights on to guide them through the reef to try and work out which way to get into the bay. It was quite wow. daunting. And then we got there and I was soaking wet um, <laughs> and then stayed there overnight woke up the next morning and there was a queue of about 20 people outside the house. They hadn't had a dentist in the area for two years and there was just people wow. had heard overnight that there was a dentist there and heaps of people came in that one day and I basically ran out of anaesthetic by sort of one or two and after that I wasn't able to do any more work. I just didn't expect to have so many people coming. Gosh. All right. So that was your first encounter. Um, but it didn't scare you off. Obviously, you went, no, I'm going to come back. There's, there's a really big need here. Uh, what, ha- what happened next? I went there and the, they were asking me to build a dental clinic. And I worked in that, that rural area. And what I saw there was we had to take out quite a few teeth. But what I did see was, in general, the decay was a lot lower. There wasn't the younger people didn't have that much decay. The older ones had some, you know, infections and and gum disease and had to have extractions but the younger kids didn't have that much decay Um, whereas when I was working in the the capital of the province when I uh, first arrived I saw a couple of 13 year olds I think and they basically needed about 10 or 12 teeth extracted and they're all adult teeth Mm. they were not fixable even if they were in Australia and had all the technology available yeah and they'd, there was no toothbrushes available in the whole um, capital city, but they were selling lollies and soft drinks and they had no you idea. You couldn't, couldn't buy a there toothbrush. There was no toothbrush or toothpaste at that stage. Um, and wow. they had no idea that they needed to brush their teeth, no idea that the sugar was causing the decay. So based on the experience between the, the – based on the difference between the capital where there was a lot of shops – and the rural area where there was hardly any shops, um, yep. I could see a big difference. So I decided that no, di- dietary. it was dietary. So there was, like a, there was no sugar um, in the 
rural area. So I concluded after that we needed to do education, like just a dental clinic providing services is not enough. So then I decided I would just come back and do some education, link up with the schools, and I thought it'd be a three-year project. First year, do some <laughs> consultation, make some links. Second year, implement. Third year, review. Uh, so That's yeah, a good plan. That was, that was eight or nine years ago. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time? I know we're, in the t- we're living uh, in a pandemic. Uh, when was the last time you made it uh, So we went there in June 2019, mm-hmm. and that was the largest um, group that I took over. The first time I took a large group. Are you taking other people with you? So what's ended up happening is I take Australian volunteers over there, uh, dentists, usually one one a dental assistant, uh, often someone else to help, and we go to the schools. We do some education. We do uh, examine all the kids' teeth, and then we uh, do treatment as well. And so that's amazing. 2019, we managed to do six schools. Uh, so we travelled by boat and then trek. Sometimes, you know, half an hour trek carrying all our gear, and yeah, do do the work there. And then at the end of the the session, like we go to the school for one or two days, we'll then see any adults if they need to. And we've trained a few local people who help us each each trip. And so over the three or four years, uh, you know, they do the sterilisation, they coordinate all the students, which can be quite quite difficult because you you go there and sometimes there's a public holiday and they don't seem to, they didn't realise there was a public holiday until on the day. So mm. everyone didn't come to school. But then they, would, they were able to go to the communities and round up all the kids and get them to come to the school to get their checkup. Uh, so, yeah, they're yep. invaluable. And they also do a lot of the education side of things as well. And we also uh, wow. give out toothbrushes. That's all off your own back, volunteering. Can, why do you do it? I, I, people often ask that. Um, I think I get more out of it than what they do. Um, you get that it's really unique to travel to a place and get that genuine connection with a local community and the local culture. So we stay in a community and um, what they now do is that that community, uh, two family households would get together and cook us a meal. So each night yeah, wow. they would, uh, two different families would cook us a meal and so we get to meet them. Over the years, we've got to know the kids. Their English is getting better. They come up. Yep. They're not shy anymore. Uh, they take us on walks. Uh, this area has no tourism at the moment. So we're virtually the only tourists that, that go there. That is a wonderful story. Um, to finish up, um, I'm going to ask, who is the first person that comes to mind if you could tell us a story about um, your time in the Solomon Islands? We have, as I mentioned, we have a few people that come and help us each time. And one lady has been helping us every trip and she travels with us uh, even to the more remote islands and stays overnight there. And I remember she came to me last time was the first time we decided to give them some money for helping us. Prior to that, it's all been volunteer. And she declined her money and she said, no, can you keep that because I want to study to become a dental assistant and help and educate people around the area. And that was that was lovely. Uh, another one was, was you know, the local, uh, the local community that were cooking us meals decided to build a communal kitchen so that all the different families can cook for us. So each one of the family members gets some money from from us rather than one person getting all the money. And then that led to a food hygiene program, uh, which we had an Indigenous community from uh, Northern Territory come over and help us with. Oh, my gosh. Ah, You just keep blowing me away. That's amazing. It's been fun. All right, uh, to our listeners, uh, thanks so much for uh, listening in. Uh, I, I think you would have enjoyed that story just as much as I did. Um, so I'm Ling, th- thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, to our listeners, don't forget, follow us on our socials, uh, listen to the other Pearly podcasts and download the Pearly app for a free dental checkup using AI. Thanks, everyone.